Hello everyone. Welcome to this course on computational complexity theory. My name is Raghunath Tiwari and uh, I'll be your instructor for this course. So today I'm going to talk about broadly two major things. I'm going to talk about firstly the course details and then I will move on to uh, some introductory top topics on complexity theory. So first of all, let me talk about uh, the course objective. So we are going to discuss what is computation. So speaking in a uh, informal way, so computation is basically a step by step process to perform a well defined task. So it can be anything, it can be solving a problem or it can be any other object where uh, you can actually give a step by step process to complete a well defined task. And in this course, we are going to look at a mathematical framework to study computation. Okay? We are not going to study computation from, let's say, by looking at a computational device or anything. We will look at computational device, but it will only be a mathematical device, a mathematical modeling. And uh, the most important uh, element in this course is the following. We are going to look at the power and limitations of various computation models. Okay, so that is actually what computational complexity is, where we look at how powerful a given computational model is or what are the limitations of a computational model okay, under various restrictions. And uh, while learning this, we'll also look at various proof techniques. Okay, so yeah and uh, finally the goal would be by the end of this course that uh, this course should make us capable of picking up a research problem in this area and probably working on it okay so that's that that is the i mean uh, high level objective that we would like to achieve by the end of this course okay, okay. so now we move to the the introduction to complexity theory, some of the introductory topics that I plan to discuss today. Okay. So in this course, we will be looking at Turing machines uh, as one of our models of computation. So what are the resources that are used in a Turing machine? So in a Turing machine, there can be many types of resources that uh, a Turing machine uses. So for example, time is a resource. What is time? Time is the number of steps that a Turing machine takes uh, to, uh, to run its input. Okay, so given an input, it's how many steps that the Turing machine take. Space can also be a resource used by a Turing machine. So space is the number of cells that are used by the Turing machine in its workspace. Okay. So we can actually uh, divide, uh, we can actually divide the space of the Turing machine into, I mean, so there can be three different types of tapes in a Turing machine, the input tape, the work tape, and the output tape. So when we count the space, it is only the space that is used in the workspace. So when we talk about more about space complexity, we will come back to this point. Then uh, the type of the Turing machine is also a resource. For example, whether it's a non-deterministic Turing machine or not, whether it's a randomized Turing machine or not. Okay, so these are also various types of resources that a Turing machine has access to. Another model of computation that uh, we will be discussing in this course is circuits. Okay, so Turing machine is more like uh, how an algorithm is run. Okay, so it's more like uh, a simulation of a computer. A circuit is slightly different. Okay, so in a circuit, you have gates, such as AND gates, OR gates, NOT gates, you might have also some other types of gates. And also there are some input gates. Okay, so input gates uh, either can be constants like zero or one, or they can be some variables x1, x2, okay, where those variables can take values one, zero in Boolean circuits. Now, the resources 
of a circuit are the following. So it can either be the size of the circuit, that is how many gates are present in the circuit. It can be the depth of the circuit, that is the maximum shortest distance between an input and output gate in the circuit. It can also be the types of gates that are used in the circuit. For example, whether you allow NOT gates or not, or uh, how do you allow the NOT gates to appear, AND gates or gates, or any types of restrictions that, uh, I mean, that makes logical sense to apply on the circuit. Okay, so these are the various types of resources. Now, okay, so under these resources, we are going to study that, for example, let's say if I'm looking at Turing machine, we are going to ask questions like, okay, if I allow polynomial amount of time uh, for a Turing machine to run, what are the types of problems that the machine can solve and cannot solve? If I allow it, maybe let's say linear amount of time, what are the kind of problems that the machine can solve or cannot solve? Similarly for space as well. Okay. Again, for circuits also, if I ask that, okay, if the machine has maybe uh, linear depth, what kind of problems can this circuit solve or cannot solve? Okay. So these are the kind of very broadly, these are the kind of questions that we would like to address. And we are going to learn how we will, uh, how, I mean, learn the techniques that are needed or the techniques that are use, usually used to address these kind of questions. Now, so I, I talked about these two models, that is Turing machine and circuits, and a very fundamental difference between these two models is what is called a uniform versus a non-uniform model. Okay. So a Turing machine is what is called a uniform model of computation, and a circuit is what is called a non-uniform model of computation. Okay. So let me say a little bit about this. So a uniform model of computation is where you have a single machine or device, whatever you want to call it, for all input lengths. Okay. For example, I'll uh, just forget about Turing machine and circuits for the time being. When you write an algorithm to solve a problem, let's say you're writing an algorithm to sort uh, an array of numbers. Now you don't write separate algorithms that will take care of arrays of separate sizes. You write one algorithm and no matter what array is given to you, array of what's, whatever size is given to you, the same algorithm actually works on all array sizes. Right? So that is what is called a uniform model. That is what is called a uniform, uh, I mean, a uniform uh, model to solve a problem. Okay. A Turing, for, a Turing machine is a uniform model. So there is only a, a single Turing machine. So if you write a, if you have a Turing machine that solves a particular problem, the same Turing machine will actually work on all input lengths. Now, circuits are actually not, uh, not uniform. In other words, if you have a circuit, a circuit only has a fixed number of variables that it can take as input. So once you have, once you define a circuit, it only has a fixed, let's say an N number of variables, which it can take an input to. Now, if you have an input whose length is maybe N plus one or N plus two, okay. You cannot actually feed it to that same circuit. You need actually a different circuit for that input length. Okay. So what we, the, the usual way to actually go about this problem is instead of having a single circuit, we have what is called a circuit family for a problem. Okay, so a problem is solved by a circuit family. What is a circuit family? A circuit family is basically a collection of circuit where you have one circuit for each input length. That is if the input length is one, you have a circuit. If the input length is two, you have another circuit. If the input length is three, you have another circuit and so on. So you have an infinite family of circuits. Okay. Now for every input, for example, let's say you have a circuit for input length 10. So then all inputs which are of length 10, uh, the circuit will, I mean, the circuit should actually correctly output the answer for all those inputs. But the point is that it will not work for an input which has length 11. Okay, so that is what is called a non-uniform model. So this is 
very important that why do we study these two things now so now the obvious question that uh, might come to you is that why do we study circuits then i mean why not just look at turing machine the reason is sometimes it is easy to prove things in a non uniform model sometimes it's easy to prove that you cannot do a certain task if you have a uh, non uniform model like a circuit okay that is the reason why we study circuits and uh, yeah so of course turing machine will be our standard model of computation because it is what uh, actually resembles uh, physical i mean any kind of physical computational device whether it's your laptop or computer or your cell phone or whatever and uh, the other thing is uh, that circuits and turing machines are actually equivalent so one can actually show or not exactly circuits but circuit family so one can actually show that whatever you can do using a turing machine can actually be done by a circuit family and whatever you can actually compute by a circuit family you can actually do by a turing machine so when we actually study more about circuits we will talk we'll formally define what a circuit family is and so on but i just wanted to give you a heads up before moving forward so next we move on to uh turing machines okay so more about turing machine so the first thing is what is what do we mean by the running time of a turing machine okay so suppose if we have a boolean function f so a boolean function is a function which takes a string as input and outputs either 0 or 1 so given a boolean function f and a function t from natural numbers to natural numbers okay and let m be a turing machine so let's say a uh, m is a deterministic turing machine we say that m computes the function f in time t of n if for all x belonging to 0 1 star m on input x holds with fx written on its output tape in at most t of x number of steps okay so in other words so given a turing machine and a function uh, a boolean function f that the turing machine is computing we say that m is computing f in time t of n if for each and every string that is possible if m is given that string as input it must output fx on its output tape so whatever is that <clears throat> the value of that function on that input x and it must uh, it can only take t of the length of x number of steps on that particular input okay not any more than that okay. now you might wonder that why are we looking at a machine computing a function as opposed to a machine computing a language so the point is that so they are actually equivalent okay so boolean functions and languages are basically the same thing so that can easily be seen so suppose if you have a boolean function f okay we can naturally define a language out of that function okay so let's call that language l of f so all the strings for which that function outputs one i put them inside that language and all the strings for which the function output zero i put it outside the language okay so the language consists of all strings which on which the function is outputting a one now similarly given any language okay so what is a language a lang language is just a subset of zero one star okay so given any language i can correspondingly define a boolean function out of it so all the strings that belong to the language i make the boolean function map to one on those strings and all the strings that are outside the language i make the boolean function map to zero on those strings okay so i get a function which is uh, from 0 1 star to 0 1 which corresponds to this language l okay so the whole point is that we can actually interchangeably talk about boolean functions and languages okay so this is very important because some at certain times we are going to talk about boolean function at certain times we are going to talk about languages and uh, when we say that the language corresponding to the boolean function this is what it means or when i say the boolean function corresponding to this language again this is what it means so you should be uh, clear about this equivalence now the next uh, 
thing is when we talk about uh, the running time of a Turing machine, what kind of functions can the running time be? Okay, or can it be any function of m? The answer is not. It cannot be any function of m. There are the typically considered functions for a running time of a Turing machine are things like linear, like n, n square, n log n, two to the power n, maybe n factorial, okay, and many others. So how do we formally define what kind of functions are allowed and what kind of functions are not allowed? So one type of function that is not allowed is, uh, so if I have a deterministic Turing machine, is something like, let's say, log n. Now, why is log n not allowed? The reason why log n is not allowed because note that log n is actually less than m. Okay. Now, if you have a running time of a Turing machine, which is log n, it just means that uh, the Turing machine is not even looking at its full input because just to look at the entire input, it will take order n steps, right? If I just have to scan through the entire input. So if it is looking at only a part of the input, it just means that uh, the Turing machine will be, let's say, I mean, for two different strings, okay, it, it I mean, it cannot even distinguish between two different strings uh, beyond log n many cells. So, I mean, it can happen. You can, of course, define a Turing machine, which maybe does nothing. I mean, given an input, it just accepts or it just rejects or something like that. But the point is that it is, uh, it's, it, it, it is not a non-trivial operation. It is, um, it's a very, it's a more trivial operation and we do not want to allow such things. Okay. So this brings us to what are known as time constructible functions, the type of functions that we allow the running time to be. So a function t is said to be time constructible if, first of all, as I said, that t is greater than or equal to m, it is at least linear. And secondly, there exists a Turing machine that on input x outputs the binary encoding of t of x in time t of x. Okay. So this is very important. Okay. So this function t that I have, there should be some Turing machine which should be able to output the binary encoding of t of x in time, let's say at most t of x. Okay. Now functions like uh, n log n or two to the power n or n factorial, these are actually time constructible functions. Okay. So if you want, you can actually look them up or you can even try to prove it by yourself that how can you design a Turing machine which will output, let's say uh, given n, uh, I mean given an input x, Okay, of length n. So you can actually design a Turing machine that uh, when given an input x of length n can output a string uh, or output the binary encoding of 2 to the power n in time at most 2 to the power n okay, or any other function that is given in this list of examples. So these are time constructible functions. Now you might wonder that what kind of functions are not time constructible. Okay. So here is an example. So if I define a function t, which is let's say equal to n squared, if n encodes a Turing machine that holds on all inputs and it is equal to two to the power n otherwise, this is an example of a function which is bigger, which is greater than or equal to n, but it is not time constructible. The reason is, I mean, given a number n, I mean, how do I even check whether n encodes a Turing machine that holds on all input or not? Because you know that this is a problem. So given n to check if uh, it encodes a Turing machine that holds on all input or not is an undecidable problem. So you cannot actually solve it using any Turing machine. Okay. Forget about doing it in time, any to n or n square or two to the power n. So, so yeah, so this is an example of a non-time -con non constructible function. Now we come to one of the major, one of the most important classes uh, that are studied in complexity theory, the class P, or the class corresponding to all problems that can be solved in deterministic polynomial time. So before that, I'll define this class d time. Okay. So given a function t from natural numbers to natural numbers, the class d time t of n is the class of all languages. Okay. 
such that there is a constant C and a Turing machine M and the machine M accepts L in time C of T of N. Okay. So essentially D time T of N is the class of all languages for which uh, there is a machine which can actually decide that language in time order T of N time. Okay. So C of T of N time. And uh, using this definition now I can define the class P as basically the union of all k greater than 0 d time n to the power k. Okay. So all classes uh, d time n to the power k for all k greater than uh, uh, greater than or e even I can say greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So most of the problems that you have seen so far in your life, the most of the problems that you have actually written algorithms for are actually problems that are in P okay, like finding maximum element in an array matrix multiplication, deciding reachability between these, between any two vertices in a graph, DFS, BFS, computing determinant of a matrix. Okay. And uh, many more. Okay. So uh, there are probably very few examples of problems that you have seen, which are not known to be in P, but most, yeah, most algorithms that you write are usually uh, polynomial time algorithms. Now we move to the next class. Uh, that is uh, the non-deterministic analog of P. And uh, this is equally, if not more important than the class P. Okay. So what was P? P is the class of those problems for which there is a polynomial time solution. Okay. On the other hand, NP is the class of those problems for which we might not be able to construct a solution uh, in polynomial time, but given a solution, we can verify that solution in polynomial time. Okay. So how do we define that formally? So NP, uh, we can define the class NP as follows. So the class NP consists of all languages L, okay, such that there is a polynomial P, okay, and a deterministic polynomial time Turing machine M. So again, please note that here M is a deterministic polynomial time machine such that for all X in zero one star for all inputs X, I would accept X. Okay. So, or, or in, in other words, the string X belongs to the language L if and only if there exists a string U whose length is at most polynomial in the length of X. Okay. So note that this P was a polynomial. So there exists a string U of length P of X such that when the machine is given both X and U, the machine accepts. Okay. So essentially what we are saying is that this L language belongs to NP. If there is actually another string U of polynomial length such that, uh, so, yeah, so this language L belongs to NP if there is a deterministic time M, okay, such that a string X belongs to the language if and only if there is uh, some polynomial string U and if the machine is given both the string X and the string U, then the machine can actually say yes. On the other hand, if let's say if you look at the uh, reverse of this state statement, what it says is that if X does not belong to L, then no matter what you you pick, okay, no matter for each and every you, the machine will always reject or the machine will always output zero. Okay. Now, uh, some terminology, this machine M that we have, which is taking the string X and the string U. So this is typically called the verifier for the language L, okay, the deterministic verifier. And the string U that we are giving which uh, helps the machine M make a decision is what is known as a certificate. Okay. So it acts like a certificate. So if X belongs to L, U kind of certifies the fact that uh, yes, indeed X belongs to L and uh, it helps the machine take the right decision. On the other hand, if uh, X does not belong to L, then no matter what certificate you give, the machine will always reject. Okay, So no, no certificate actually exists. So if X is in L, there is actually at least one certificate. There can actually be more than one certificate as well, which validates the fact that X is in L. And if X is not in L, then all certificates that you give, which have this length, polynomial length, will validate the fact that X does not belong to L. In other words, M will 
reject uh, x comma u. So this is what is known. Uh, this is what we mean by efficient verification. Okay, so we are not able to. So uh, there is no deterministic polynomial time machine M, which when given x can say whether, whether to accept or not. But if we are given a certificate along with the machine, then we can easily say whether to accept or not. So now let's look at a example. We we'll look at this problem called the satisfiability problem. Okay. So, what is the satisfiability problem? So, the satisfiability problem consists of Boolean formula. So, I am assuming all of you know what a Boolean formula is. So, Boolean formula is a formula consisting of uh, variables and uh, gates such as AND, OR, and NOT gates. And uh, the language set consists of those Boolean formulas which are satisfiable. So what is a satisfiable Boolean formula? A satisfiable Boolean formula is a Boolean formula such that there is some assignment of values to the variables uh, to the variables of that Boolean formula, which makes the formula accept. And on the other hand, uh, unsatisfiable Boolean formula will be one such that no matter what values, I mean, no matter what uh, assignment of values you give to the variables of that formula, it will never accept, it will always reject, it will always output zero. Okay. Now, we say that a formula is satisfiable if there exists at least one satisfiable assignment. Okay. So this satisfiable assignment is, this assignment is also what is known as a truth assignment. Okay. Now, how do we show that the problem is in NP? So we show that this problem sat is in NP very trivially. So my certificate here will be a truth assignment tau. Okay, so it is tau is nothing but an assignment of values to all the variables. So if this formula has n variables, then tau is basically assigning either zero or one to each of the n variables. So it's just a string of length n. It's a Boolean string of length n. What is the verifier? The verifier is a Turing machine that when given phi and tau, it just checks whether tau satisfies phi. If I just plug in the values of tau to each and every variable in phi, whether it evaluates to one or it evaluates to zero. Okay. Now this M can be designed in polynomial time, which takes a Boolean formula and it takes a assignment of values to all the variables of variables of the Boolean formula and then says whether it outputs zero or one. So this can be designed in polynomial time. And of course the length of tau is polynomial. Not only is it polynomial, it is only linear. So this proves that the problem set is a uh, belongs to NP. Now, yeah. So another way of uh, trying to understand this or trying to see this uh, certificate verifier model is to think of this as a game between an all-powerful prover and a computationally restrictive verifier. Okay, so there are these two people. Okay. Now, the prover is all powerful. The prover actually given an input, it can immediately answer whether that input belongs to a language or not. For example, the prover given a formula phi, it knows whether it is satisfiable or not. But the verifier is computationally restrictive. The verifier only has deterministic polynomial amount of power. Okay. You can think of it like that. I mean, it cannot, for example, given a formula phi, if you're only given phi, how do you check whether it is satisfiable or not? Okay. One way to check whether a formula is satisfiable or not is to cycle over each and every truth assignment. Now, how many possible truth assignments are there? There are two to the power n truth assignments. Okay. Now this formula can actually be satisfiable on any one of those truth assignments, right? You don't know which one it, which one satisfies that formula and which one doesn't. So, and if you actually have to cycle through all of them, it takes much more than polynomial time. Okay. And as it turns out, there is, we can't do actually much better than two to the power n. So this is an algorithm. This is a deterministic algorithm, which takes two to the power n time. But unfortunately, even the best known algorithms uh, don't solve this problem in time. That is any, uh, maybe slightly better than two to the power n, but not much better. Certainly nowhere close to being in polynomial time. So the point is the verifier cannot actually solve the problem directly. So the goal of the prover here is to produce the certificate. Okay. So the prover actually wants to convince the verifier somehow that 
to accept the input now what the prover can do is because the prover is all powerful given any input let's say given a boolean formula phi the prover actually can produce the certificate and then pass on so the input is accessible to both the prover and the verifier now the prover actually gives the verifier the certificate now if the input was indeed in the language then we know by the definition that there exists some certificate okay now the verifier when given the input and the certificate can actually check in polynomial time whether uh, it is in the language or not okay on the other hand suppose if you have an input which is not in the language then no matter what certificate the prover produces the verifier always ends up rejecting because we know that uh, by definition if a language is not in np then uh, for each and every certificate of polynomial length the machine m when given x and that certificate does always reject okay so this is uh, this is broadly how we show that a problem belongs to np so we produce a certificate we say what the certificate should be we give the verifier algorithm and uh, then just argue why that algorithm runs in polynomial time and why the length of that certificate is also polynomial in the length of the input so usually the third and the fourth steps are quite easy it is only producing the certificate and the verifier's algorithm which is little bit non trivial at times but again usually that also follows from the definition itself the definition of the problem itself okay now so if you recall so we started off by talking about uh, the class polynomial time and we define polynomial time in terms of uh, deterministic turing machine but when we talked about np we defined np in terms of the certificate verifier model so is there any other definition of np okay and in fact the name np it's, uh, itself stands uh, for non deterministic polynomial time okay so there actually exists another alternate definition for np based on non deterministic turing machines so what is that definition so similar to d time we can define the class n time tn as class of all languages okay such that there is a constant c and uh, a non deterministic turing machine m and the machine m accepts l in time c times p of n okay and now i can define np as union over k greater than 0 of n time n to the power k okay now why are these two definitions the same so here is a, de a one definition of np using n time using this class n time there was another definition of using np using the certificate verifier method okay so i will just leave this as a, an exercise today for you to prove that if you have any language which uh, so you you, ha you have these two definitions of np okay so you take any language in np using let's say the previous definition so there can only be one definition for an entity so if you take a language which belongs in np you can prove that that language also belongs to union of k greater than 0 n time n to the power k similarly if you take a language which belongs to the right hand side that is union over k greater than 0 n time n to the power k then it also belongs to np by the certificate verifier definition okay so please try to prove this by yourself you don't have to submit these exercises that i give in class unless i explicitly tell you that this is something that you have to submit this is only for your practice okay so i will end here today